going live. Doop -de doop. We are live. All right. Welcome to Worldwide Sock Car Chat on Zoom number 206. I'm your host, Greg Gab. The gang's all here. We got Mike and Jeremy and Gio and Wayne and John and John and John and Don and Don and John and Dewan and John and Dar and Garth and Jim and John and Dewan and John and John. Let's talk slot cars. There's so many Johns. Let's talk slot cars. Any kind of slot car. You are perfectly welcome to come. HO guys, commercial guys, whatever. Even if some of these guys don't care for that stuff, I welcome you. Come and show us your cool slot car stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also want to do another reminder for the worldwide slot car chat on Zoom proxy. If you want to uh, host a race, we have not yet published the proxy spec that's coming up. But if you want to be a host for the race, all you got to do is uh, click the link. I'll put it in the chats to download the form. On the form is my email. You fill it out. You send it to me. And we'll put you in the, the running for being a host. And hopefully we'll have uh, specs for, for people to look at in the, in the next few weeks. Uh, I think that's it. So if you want to do show and tell, raise your virtual hand and I'll call on you. Geo is ready to go. Go ahead, Geo. Hey, so, uh, okay. So I was kind of scared what Duan was uh, throwing some kind of uh, red dildo look like, but it's a toy for the dog. Okay. Everything's safe. Uh, so I want to show a couple of uh, kind of tools that have been buying from, uh, I mean, I buy from AliExpress, but you can find in all the kind of a similar kind of website. So the first one is uh, a soldering iron. So this is a uh, mini wear, I think it's called. Yeah. So it's a kind of, uh, it's not a, a cordless one. So you have to provide the power, power supply to it um it's i mean this stuff can if you have the right power supply can um go up to 90 watts so it's pretty powerful thing for what i need to use it i mean mainly like uh you know wiring soldering wires to the motors or kind of small cheaper repairs it's more than than enough so at the moment i'm using it with uh you know these uh cheap Power supplies that uh, so this gets up to 12 volts and uh, can get I mean this can go up to 300 uh, uh, degrees Celsius degrees in um, I would say maybe 30 seconds with this stuff but if you use a proper power supply it can go much quicker than that I mean under 10 seconds I think it has like presets and whatnot what I really like is. Uh, Super light, so super small. And the other thing also like as a changeable, you can change tips very easily. So just put them in and put them out. I mean, you can also have a, like a screws if you want to do it, but look at the tip. So this is uh, one of the tips. So it's pretty small. I can go even smaller than these. I, I bought a bunch of, uh, bunch of them. So like for instance, this one, that's going to be super cool for, I need to repair chips. I don't know if you can, I mean, it doesn't focus with the picking camera, but I mean, you can see how small it is. So with, this, with the actual tip, yeah, so go ahead, Greg. Just saying it looked very fine, very sharp. Yeah. And um, so with this one that I have here, that is not the smallest one, I mean, it's stock, kind of almost stock. Uh, I repair component that I think was, uh, what was the smallest one? Something like uh, maybe, Three by two millimeters on a chip, so that was a very bit. And I did it with the other one. I went even smaller than uh, than that. So is it called not, a T, is it called a TS thirty or something, Gio? No, no this is uh, the TS one hundred one. TS one hundred one. So yeah, there is a TS one hundred, and then this is the next iteration, I believe. I think you can reuse the tips from TS one hundred. It's got a barrel plug in the bottom of the handle, that right? Yeah, so you can uh, you can use, yeah, good point. So you have uh, both uh, USB-C and barrel uh, power, kind of power supply. So I think if you can go barrel up to, and you can go up to the, um, with the 28 volts power supply, you can go up to the 90 uh, watts. 
Does that go I straight on the adapter to or your power supply unit? Is it fit? Is it the same two and a half mil diameter? Not two and a half, six and a half. I think it is on the on the power supply. Okay. So the one, this one, and the yeah. one, this it's a five, five point five. And does it fit straight on there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my word, that's perfect for me because I I base yeah. everything off of one of those supplies. Yeah. So, but the, the other thing is like, uh, and it's not here yet. I bought uh, like a proper power supply that I think they should provide. Uh, you know those uh, volts. I mean, you know, voltage amperage that are required because it can go up to twenty eight volts. It's not here yet. I mean, if you put the whole package together, because also you need the proper cable, so then I think it's going to be uh, around, uh, I think, 130, 140 uh, New, uh, New Zealand dollars. So then you make your conversion. I mean, so it's not super cheap, as I said, but no. I mean, what I have is, is kind of uh, an improvement and does a very good job. So the other kind of way, I've had two. Uh, kind of uh, show and tell, let's say. So the other one is these, uh, these are cordless or wireless uh, drill. Um, again, these are pretty cheap. I believe maybe it was 20 bucks or 30 bucks, something like that. So what I like is that it has a five different speed. So normally these cheaper ones can go down to 5,000 RPMs up to whatever you want. I mean, but this has, a, and normally they have three steps. So this has five steps. It can go down to 3,000 RPMs. Still not as low as I would like to, but it's pretty good for some uh, work, like removing material from uh, pods, for instance. Uh, I've not tried this for lighting up like a body uh, yet, but this would be something that uh, I will find later on. So. Uh, and the other things that I, I find pretty cool, and this I think was with the help of Wayne actually pointed out, because we were discussing about this kind of tools. It has also an LED so that you can look at what's going on. And these, I mean, these LED things are actually, you know, I kind of really enjoy when I'm working on things and providing that they are there. I think they help quite a lot. Now, the bad thing is that the chuck is, you know, those cheap ones that you need to kind of, uh, sorry, uh, screw and then change the the barrel here, you know, the two, you know, if you want to have like a small. The collet, yeah. Yeah, the collet. Yeah, actually the collet. Yeah. So, but uh, I bought, so that is still not here, unfortunately, but I, I bought one that can fit on top of this. So it's chuck. And this can go between 0 0.3 to 3.5, I think, millimeters. So, which is for what we do most of the stuff for that. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, the, the kind of bits that we use, I think, covers most of the stuff that uh, we I normally use at least for slot car. And then that's the other the, one. Sorry, ahead. that's the, that's the oh. constant battle I have with my own one of those switching from 2.6 millimeter to 3.2 for all the different bits I've got that fit. It's constantly switching the collet. It's a pain. It's a My bigger Dremel does have a three jaw chuck, but I don't. Yeah, it's just, I the, it's just too I big. Rotary, yeah, I have the rotary tool that uh, I got to, from uh, Greg. Basically, I mean, uh, yeah. I don't remember the Proxon, and that Proxon. one. Yeah, it's very nice because it, the chuck there you can go almost you know all the size that I need ever. Now the other thing, you know, if you need something that goes even below three thousand RPMs. So I find another cordless rotary tool, it's this one. So this one is basically uh, for uh, filing, I mean, for nail kind of uh, work. I think um, for polishing nails and crap like that. So the main advantage of this stuff is that, um, so if you turn on, you have, uh, I don't know if you can see, but uh, so, I can go. You've got numbers on that. No here numbers. now, and I can go up, up, and up. Actually, it's saying error. Just say. So because the chuck was open. Uh, so you can, I think, here. So basically, you can go from uh, to zero, basically, in terms of RPM. So it can, can be really kind of very selective by rotating this tool up here. Okay, so it's cordless and we're not. Uh, 
I can also rotate it the other way around as well. So can you can decide which kind of rotation. The only kind of downside is that it has uh, the chuck is a fixed 2.5, I believe, or 2.3. Uh, and for that, there is also a solution. So again, on AliExpress, you can buy um, a chuck that is like between 0 0.3 to 0 0.3 point, I mean, to 3.5, that has a shaft that is okay for fitting here. So I don't have it here yet. So when it arrives, I will kind of maybe next one showing how it works or how, if it works basically. But the thing is that you can find some kind of tools of bits actually that has the 2.5 kind of shaft that you can fit here, especially for kind of polishing stuff, cutting stuff, for instance. Not the drill bits yet. I mean, those are 3.5, I believe. You know, if you if there are these kind of very fine ones that you can find on AliExpress, I, I did manage to find the 2.5. But yeah, if I if I get that chuck that basically has the you know um, that goes between from zero point three to three point five, and it works well with this stuff, then I you know I can use whatever kind of other bits I'm using with the, the other the other tool without uh, big uh, big issues. So I don't know the battery life, how long it lasts. I mean, I've used this one for kind of cutting or removing the material from. Um, uh, I think it was uh, NSR pod, you know, where there are the pockets for the magnets, because usually I remove that, you know, to make it as flat as possible, either for putting chip or putting uh, um, lead. And even like, a, I mean, you need to go at kind of 5,000 RP, 5, RPMs or more, but it has enough torque to not stall while you're doing it. So it's a really kind of, I mean, you can work with, with, uh, with this stuff. But I don't know the battery life yet. And uh, both of them use, I think, USB B, not C. Or maybe this is C and this is B. But it, they come with the cable that you you need. And I don't know, so the charging time. So I've not used them long enough to tell you, you know, yeah, if I if I have to work for you know 12 for hour, 24 hours race, for instance, if there would be enough with one charge, I don't know. But or what I need to have them on the bench easily now without having like cables, you know, messing around on your working bench more than uh, more than useful. Again, the soldering iron is with the wires, so it's not uh, a battery operating wire. That's the, although it looks like, but it's not. That's me. If you guys have any questions, you are rotary tool rich now, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking like, do I need another one? But you know, it's. They always, I mean, for what they cost, I mean, maybe the the one, the nail file is the cheap, is a bit more expensive, like a thirty New Zealand dollars. It's a bit more expensive, but you know, it's always handy to have uh, some of these two. And again, it's not like super expensive. The solder iron is a different story, a bit more expensive. But I was looking for a proper station, you know, with a temperature control or whatnot. But, you know, those one we're talking about 250, 300. I mean, if you want something that is kind of decent enough, right? So, but what I need, especially for cheap or LED work, if I have to work on chips or LED components, you know, it's more than... Uh, People should never work. underestimate the value of a small rotary tool like that, because once you have one, you off honestly wonder how you ever got by without one. I mean, even yeah. even if you had a tool that could take, that didn't have to replace the chuck, all you had to do was replace the bit that you're using. Even then, it's more convenient to have two tools. Like, uh, you, know, wood, yeah. you know, carpenters will have two two hand drills, one to use, one to drill with, and the other to drive with, because otherwise you're you're you're, you're tripling your work time by having to change between the two things. So yeah, nothing wrong with all that. All righty, moving on. Mr. Weber, you got your hand up? Yeah. Got some progress on your car? Yeah, no, well, so, some, but I'm going to tag onto uh, GOC. And <laughs> Go ahead. Let's see. I have a little thing here. Mine's bigger than yours. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This, this I, I found it uh, old. Occasionally, they have stuff like this, tools and things like that. It's, it's lithium-ion battery-powered. 
Okay, so, uh, and it's really, really nice. It's a fair X brand, which I believe is common, uh, common in Germany, which I think uh, Aldi is. And it, uh, it has a, a dial oh, yeah. change the speeds. And yeah, this, that's like my big one. This LED is uh, power availability, how, how much power is left in the battery. So, uh, this thing works really well. But like, like you were talking about, you had to change comments all the time. And, and a three-jaw chuck would be, would be great. It would be fun, fun. But then... Uh, there's one in the Dremel parts list. You'll find that an original Dremel one is available and likely to fit the thread on your uh, output neck. It could be. This, yeah. these, found these. Mm -hmm. um, I can also kind of, you know, since size matters here. Yeah, when I need to use something bigger, I can use this one. These yeah. trucks yeah, for bigger, bigger work. Those are the those are the <laughs> drills that have all. <laughs> those are the drill bits that all have a three point two millimeter shank, aren't they, John? They can go down as, as much as I want, and also it's like with the throttle, I can control much better the speed. If I if when I need to drill my three millimeter kind of LEDs holes, this is a perfect tool that I use all the time. <laughs> and also wireless. Well, uh, you're right about the the the. Uh small handheld rotary tools too. I mean, I've gotten into these resin bodies. You've got to have something like that to, to uh, relieve a lot of the excess material that's uh, yeah. underneath the mold. And then, uh, yeah, I was gonna show these these little drill bits. And I, my understanding is that they're pretty inexpensive. It's, you can get a whole set of them. I think this looks like 12 bucks or something. They uh, are were originally, or their their main use is for carburetor jets. So they have to be very precise, pretty strong, uh, well made. And these these all they are. I have a couple of other sets too that are much older. This most recently I got, and uh, they're, they're pretty cool, pretty neat. Uh, tiny, tiny, very precise holes. Uh, another thing I wanted to touch on was. Uh, some motors, perspective slot car, of course. Uh, this is a slim can motor, what what we would call a slim, slim can. And then this is another one, I just extricated from an old dead toothbrush. Motor works, uh, but you can see the design is almost almost exactly the same, it's just larger. Is, is that what they call a long can? Anyway, can't, I'm, I'm not displaying these, but sorry about that. Anyway. It looks like it. It looks yeah. like an FK-180, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me try that again. No, without something to compare it to, though. Yeah, this is a... Teak. Hold it up there you go. Let's see the difference in size. This is a slim can. I got yeah. some slot car form. Uh, it looks the, like it could be, yeah. Uh, this one is much like. So I guess it's a like a. That's not a flat six or something. I mean, the well, a slot car good. proxy that ran on toothbrush motors. Do we? I think there was once. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, the, it sounds the, pretty. The that, motor sounds that, pretty healthy. I think it's up to a power supply. On and that. Then, on that toothbrush motor, what size is the shaft? Uh, I think it's two millimeters. I just measured it. And can't remember. No. But let's see here. It's some dandy dandy plastic Grunier calipers. Appears to be one and a half, but it's obviously larger than the other. So, mm. the one that's supposed to be a slim key. We'll find out. Anyway, here's uh, something Dennis mentioned. And I happen to have a cool old Sony video <laughs> video A case. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like something fugitive from a Star Trek set. Yeah. Anyway, without the labels. Then inside. 
also stuck. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hot Wheels right over. Picked up some deep thing. It works. It's a little yeah. beat up, but it works. That'll come in for for bragging for next week. Anyway, we've been out on the street shooting the cars passing by with that. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, <laughs> big trucks. They're like uh, screaming by. Uh, yeah, the police really like it when you shoot it at them. Uh, yeah, just, they, they they're like good for the goose kind of stuff. But that's why it's orange and not black. I know it's like metallic orange and silver. Yeah. Looks like something from Buck Rogers. Yeah, if they're trying to take it to an airport, they will wonder. Yeah, yeah. Where, where's your green laser? Uh, I got I got stopped with an uh, an SCP controller, wondering what the hell it was. <laughs> Okay, that's everything I have. Thank you. All right, thanks, John. Garth, you're next. Go ahead. I have a uh, uh, update on my uh, the crazy motor pod. Okay. Uh, if I can get this over here. This is the uh, the test car. Um, the number two test car with the with the uh, pod that's got the rotating tube uh, uh, pod in it. Okay, and uh, okay, that, so it's got the same body on it. Okay, I made a few updates to it. Okay, here's the original <clears throat> version, which had a uh, six gram Mauer plate in the front of it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, and I wanted to take that out and change the balance front to back. So I <clears throat> made a plate that's only two grams. So basically I removed four grams out of this area or out of the front, okay? And uh, that's the rear end of the original. And this just had five millimeter screws in there with a rubber, with a, uh, um, a silicone O-ring underneath the screw head. Uh, underneath the chassis yeah and this is the new version okay which has uh got these bosses here um you know on the pod have been drilled out for clearance holes for an m m2 diameter screw and these are 10 millimeter wafer head screws in from the bottom and those are um two millimeter foam uh, washers that I made up. Okay, two on each side with uh, nylock nuts. And this 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 really worked quite well, actually, compared to the other ones anyway. And I've tried a bunch of different configurations, some of which with no foam or no nothing and just loose screws. And that, that worked pretty well. But this, this worked the best of all as far as speed and... Um, you know, drivability. Okay. That's the underneath and it shows these, the type of screw. It's a wafer head screw. It's a real small screw. And also you see, I got weight in this uh, pocket. Now the first version didn't have the weight in the pocket. And so there's uh, approximately one millimeter of weight put in here. So four millimeters came out of the front. One millimeter came out of the back. Grams. grams. You mean grams. Yeah. I'm sorry, grams, yeah. And uh, let's go, let me go to the next thing here. Uh, and that's the... Uh, can you get... Oh, can you see that okay? You stopped right okay. here. I did? Yeah. Shit. Try it again. How about that? There we go. Yeah. Okay. This and this is uh, just the kind of the conglomeration of all, all the stuff I just showed. This is the the car. It's a poly car, and you know this is all the stuff that's on it. The addition here was uh, <clears throat> this suspension system. Okay, with the two millimeter with the the uh, ten millimeter screws and the two millimeter foam and the nylocks. And then here's comparison. Uh, to the older version, the old weight was 76 grams with 58 
a rear uh, 42 front for the bias. The new weight of the car with the, the weight changes is 73 grams. So it's three grams lighter. And the front to rear bias changed quite a bit as well to 6040, which is really nice. Here's the old lap time, which I actually thought was pretty good. Uh, all, right in the 25 to 30, uh, 26 sec second range with a very out, outside hair on fire lap of 23.8. The new lap time is considerably faster. Okay, it's a second, second and a half faster, easy. And I think it might even be more than that now. And with the best lap of at least a, a second faster, it just just a quite a huge difference, just from shifting a little weight, you know, front to back, and uh, changing the changing the pot the flow to the pod, okay, in the rear, okay, and so I don't think I can do much more to make it make it any better than that. So, did you ever do a, a weight balancing without any ballast? Uh, yeah, like what was the distribution with all the lead removed? Yeah, like it, if you just put a mower plate in there right off the bat without doing any other weighing, then maybe you're just... Yeah, I, I never did. You mean just uh, do it without any weight in it? Yeah, yeah. check it out yeah. without any lead. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, It'd be about 70. Just looking, at it, just looking at it like a layman, you know, it's two, two uh, grams in the front and one in the... In front of the motor so that that's what would come out okay yeah uh, but the and, bias might still be pretty close yeah yeah it might it might be okay so that's a good that's a good point okay but you know what um uh i think what you're discovering is that the motors like pulling no weight they love it um the uh and uh well you know it's almost like I don't want to touch it now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you are quickly becoming really, a proxy driver, a proxy racer. It's really nice. I mean, it's just, you know. It's... Let, let me give you an example. I Just today I saw a guy post his car that he's been working on on Facebook. And um, it was, it's a, it was, you know, I'll, I'll try not to do too many specifics, but it was absolutely laden down with weights just all over the place and he was uh, you know both he was both happy that he got a particular lap time because it was you know presumably faster than previously but lamenting how it doesn't perform very well <laughs> and i had to bite my tongue because i know that he did not want to hear me say take all that weight out just just take it all back out because there's absolutely no way on god's green earth that what i was looking at was less than 30 grams worth of weight all over all over his chassis probably more he's big big old chunks of steel all over the place there's no way that car doesn't perform better with with less weight if not all of that weight removed Obviously, you're you're not doing that. Yeah, this I I, I <laughs> but, am. But my point my I point to him him would have been, well. and my point that I've made previously, and that other guys have made is, always start with zero ballast. Yeah, that's the last thing that you do is add ballast. Right. Was that car running on wood or plastic? Yes. Don't know. Okay. <laughs> so for instance, for for wood man, I mean, it's kind of. I don't agree. I mean, the lead makes a huge, huge difference. When you are putting in the equation uh, magnetic power from the motor, then it's a different story. So both with the copper tape, right? I mean, I I, I don't know the, all the specifics, and again, I don't want to go into too much detail because it will this person will probably see this video and get upset about it. But the point being, I'm not trying to say that no weight is always better than weight. I'm saying that. You should you should do all your tuning before adding any weight, and then when you add weight, it's to it's to cure an ailment of some sort in the performance of the car. Yeah, well, I mean, it's also experience, right? Because you know, when I was preparing cars for my analog race, I already know where I need to put the weight, so I knew how a car would perform.
before, right? So there is already that kind. Of, so again, but it's like another corner case that you know maybe. But I want to make sure that we understand that you know also in which kind of kind of settings we are we are trying to work here. Right? I mean, but but I also think it's worth. I also think that it's worth questioning your own experience from time to time. You know, if you always do a certain type of car a certain way, you know, every once in a while, go ahead and try a different way and see if you're still right. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I do. And that's why I like slot okay. cars, right? Because it's always a different thing. And then also when you work with other people, like, you know, I'm learning a lot with the work with Wayne, for instance, yeah. because he has much yeah. more uh, analytical way of dealing with all this kind of stuff that uh, for me, it's kind of bringing it to another level. But, you know, also, you see what other people do in your track, right? In order to see if you want to be competitive or not. And believe me, I also have tried the other way around. And especially on wood, you know, I can tell you that from my experience, that track, lead makes, I mean, ballast makes a huge, a huge difference. Yeah. But I've not played around with some weight distribution, for instance, that Wayne is very keen on, like the magical kind of formula. Uh, I don't think there is one. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, it, yeah. It, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I pay attention, but I don't. I don't think I could give anybody a firm answer. I do. What I do believe, however, is that if your center of gravity isn't low enough, then you do need that weight. And I think that's the case that you, you, you're speaking of, Gio. When you go to the wood track, you need the CG really, really low. And even though there's a slight disadvantage to the acceleration and braking. The advantage of the low CG through the corners is a far bigger advantage than the disadvantage that you've uh, necessarily brought to the car with the you know with the power to weight ratio. And, and even so, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are some drivers who the way that they drive prefers a heavy car because yeah. it forces them to brake earlier and and have a, a lower acceleration rate because of the weight. And it actually helps them get better lap times because yeah. of the way they drive. Well, I, I really appreciate Garth's uh, uh, presentations about how he's changed, how he goes through these changes. And, and sometimes it's seat of the pants. Sometimes it's pretty scientific stuff. And he, he's getting help from Jeremy, too. I remember him mentioning early on when he was developing this new chassis and his lightweight wheels and, and things that he was having trouble keeping the thing in the slot. Of course, that's a Carrera track, but uh, uh, putting the weight in the right spots helped him overcome that. And I think that was primarily the front. But uh, you know, it, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but anyway. Uh, the, the main that, reason that I brought it up was because he, he, had, he had removed and moved weight and achieved a better lap time when the the end result was actually a lighter car from you know yes the weight moved but overall it was a lower amount of weight and we did yeah, and uh yeah. i think know, we, sort of our, we sort of fool ourselves sometimes when we see uh photos and things on the forums of these really fast cars but they're well, a lot of them are those uh or euro cars or something they have enormously powerful motors and they can pull a lot of weight they can yeah move a lot of that later and, and as long as it like you say keeps the cg slow and you've got some traction they're incredibly fast but we're talking about plastic chassis cars that's something different uh with you know where you're where you're you know, like there's a d130 f130 whatever motor that's you know it's a completely different thing that's what he's trying to do too but uh, i think you're right yeah I guess, I guess I should have done this as a separate topic because I really did not mean to completely derail Garth's, Garth's thing. Well, me neither. Are you, sorry. Are you, <laughs> no. Pretty I, much no I, I, did, I did actually violate my own uh, rule about making more than one change on that thing. I, I took lead out of the front, added lead in the back, and then I put the suspension system in there. So yeah. I... I broke my own rule doing that but man i'm telling you oh boy you know <laughs> yeah really nice you know is it is it matching the very the other car now with the lap time actually i kind of just ignored the other car completely okay 
And uh, I think it might be a little faster, if anything, okay? Uh, I think what's going to, what's happened, Wayne, is, you know, it was like, you know, the 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 mule and the test car. And now the mule kind of did its job and went away. And now there's, it's going to be replaced with other test cars, okay? You know, like uh -huh. yeah. maybe one that Greg suggested that I, something I didn't do, which was, take out all the weight out of the chassis before I even started, okay? Because I started with a chassis that had weight in it, okay? So I didn't bother to take the plate out before I started. So I could very easily just, you know, duplicate the the, the te uh, test car number two with a car with, without weight in it and see, see what happens or just pull the weight out. What's really nice, Garth, is that your lap time really can show the difference between A and B. I was recently running a test track in my living room and my lap time on there was 3.5 seconds. And when I got it to 3.3, .3, I thought, well, that's barely made any damn difference. And then I shared that information with my group and Courtney actually said to me, it was Courtney that woke me up to the concept that, you know what, if you've just done that on a 3.3 .3 second lap, You've taken half a second and more out of a 12 second lap, and that was worth it. Ah, yeah, he's right, you know. That, that is absolutely true. You gotta you gotta realize what what you know what the distance is and stuff. Yeah. But I was overjoyed with the uh suspension, even though I haven't tried the suggestion of Jim Rose putting the suspension underneath the pod as opposed to above the pod. And I had I had tried with some other cars. Um, what he wants you to do is put some absorption in between the motor pod and the chassis. Yeah, and you've, yeah. Got, you've gone some way towards it. We need a, 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 a modified yeah. chassis. If to, I might comment, you motor pod to do that with. But I can tell you that I uh, after this exercise, okay, the foam. I'm going to try actually going with more foam. You know, I use two that. millimeter spacers, and I'm going to go. Yeah. And that's where I wanted to make a comment. You, you, there is a danger that your foam washers could um, spread around the nylon nut that you have on top. Yes, that's true. If you have the ability to put a washer above the foam, in between the nylon nut and the foam, that would keep the foam against the foam and not allow it to spread around the nut. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. And I got, I got a local, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Midwest guy working on uh, some special spacers for me. So, and uh, I might even actually put a plate. I, I'm going to experiment with putting, instead of putting, you know, um, two sets of washers on each side, I'm going to put a two sets of Why washers. Two to get two, two together. Yeah. You know, with a, with a, with a wall, like a, a plate on top and, you know, I'm going to put yeah. do a bunch of different stuff. Like well, that. if you, if you thread that plate, if you thread that plate and it's made of, um, FDM 3D print, you can completely eradicate the nuts. You can screw well, into the plate. Well, you know, I'm not, uh, that's, maybe, that's maybe here or the, there, but uh, the, something the, like a brass or a aluminum underneath the, underneath the nylon nut, put a brass or aluminum ferrule that goes down through the, through the phone. See what I'm saying? Anyway, just an idea. Like that would be like a bump stop. Maybe. Well, he's got the shaft of the screw. He doesn't really need a ferrule for the spokes to go around. If the screw no, is doing that. It, it, it's it's a suspension, but it's not because of the. And this is kind of going to be kind of hard for me to explain, but the the. Uh, Keep in mind that the it's this rotating tube in the pod thing, okay, which is sort of like the whole inside of the chassis has got this spider web thing happening, okay, and and then I throw suspension on the back so that when the motor torques, okay, it it the suspension allows it to move on the on the on the on the foam, and. I, once again, the, my expression for it is the car absolutely feels like it's planted all the time. Okay, like it's got its feet under it. Okay, you know yeah. what I mean. It doesn't it doesn't 
feel like it wants to go backward or or slide sideways or anything. You know, it go it it when it's either braking or yeah. or, or not or braking or accelerating. So what you've, what you've done, Garth, is, is you've allowed the twist that would take place in the car, which is a, a an, an amount that I can't measure, but it definitely happens. Yeah. But instead of allowing that twist only to happen between the guide and the front of the motorpod, because from the front of the motorpod to the back is stiff in traditional motorpods. Uh, that folk, that what that does, unless you uh, release the screws at the front of the motorpod, motor pod, it puts all that twist into the front half of the chassis base plate. And what you've done by allowing your pod to twist is you've moved that twist action to the whole length of the chassis base plate now, which has effectively softened the whole thing. Yes, and I think that's where I, you're finding your extra grip and your extra. I do agree with that consistency. Uh, that I do absolutely agree with that statement. It, I and that would be my my description was it feels like it's got its feet underneath it all the time. Okay, now that could maybe be a bad thing at some point. I mean, if you had a really high torque and motor or something, but in this particular case on my particular tests, um, there's nothing bad that's coming out of this so far. So you know what I mean. I I got another test car uh, going. This is a Ferrari F40. Okay. And I've got a slew of F40, so I can make you know every any version I want. And I'm also uh, building another <clears throat> chassis of a Lancia LC2, which is another one of my favorite cars. Okay, with the same motor pod and stuff in it. Okay, so I have two parallel tests going on with two different kind of cars, and, and you know, I'll see the differences between uh, longer or shorter wheelbases and all that other stuff you know like hide the bodies and everything so but anyway it's been nice so far it's great to watch Garth it's, it's entertaining for you to give give us your feedback and confirm what we believe or teach us something new it's great yeah and and in that vein <laughs> you you're talking about tying together the the basically the sprues of the of the rear suspension right mm -hmm. with some kind of bar uh Maybe well, I've, I've got the first thing is I'm going to tie them together with the foam. The foam, instead of having foam spacers on each one, it's going to have two, a two. It's right now it's got two foam spacers on each side. It's going to have a foam spacer that goes all the way across. Okay. In that essence, in essence, it, it's going to do. It's just going to. It's kind of an ease of uh, assembly. Ease of manufacturing. Yeah. And then. Uh, and then maybe on the top, when I said washer, okay, the maybe on the top of it, okay, on the top of that foam sandwich, okay, is going to be something akin to a washer, but it might be made out of thin ABS plastic or something like that, okay? So, yeah. well, so I'm addressing that uh, in in so far as the, I don't know if they still do it, but the original slotted magnetic suspension system came with a crossbar for both the top and the bottom of the suspension screws. I assembled it as per their instructions and it kept racking. It kept, it kept sticking in a, in a racked position because mm -hmm. things weren't perfect. So the first thing I did was clip those stupid things apart and it worked great. Yeah. This is this, their spring suspension kit ties at the, as the shoes, as the uh, screws come through the chassis, there's a bar, there's a bar there that connects. Which and then there's another one at the, the top bar, of the screen. Bar go longitudinally or, or horizontally? Hor horizontally, from or one screw to the other. Between the two, between the two rear pod screws. Yeah, so yeah. You, you had a you had an A frame thing going on like this. But it binds it binds like hell. Yeah, my one, I, I cannot get the stock the stock slotted suspension functioning well at all. It just binds like hell. That you know, uh, point well taken, Greg and. I will be aware of that. Okay. And I'm just going to, I'm going to try it with foam. See, I, I, I thought yeah, I'll try with foam problem. and let, let it, you know, it'll, yeah. if it wants foam, to. The foam will be fine. And, and probably even plastic will be fine. Okay. Just don't do it any, just don't do it with the. You really, you really need to keep bottom. those screws parallel to one another. That's the most important thing. Because exactly. if you get those too, too long or too short, you introduce a potential for binding. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's humanly possible to set those up. With the with 
that exacting of parallelism. You'd need to open up. Yeah, they're pretty. Room. They're pretty wonky in there, so yeah. because they're just you know, I got them. Yep, just want you to watch out for that. Yeah. The only problem with that is it's difficult. You have to take the body off in order to adjust it, which yeah. is kind of a pain in the ass. But the performance may be worth it. Well, the performance definitely is worth it now. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, who's the? Who's Might the, not make a damn bit bit of difference as far as the the round foam and the you know just the it's just a different you know span or something. Uh, but I I do think there's some level of uh, um, you know, experiment that can be done with uh, stacking the foam. Okay, I, I specifically did not want to go. I I actually started off with a silicone, a military grade silicone foam that was reasonably a lot thicker. It was like uh, maybe five millimeters thick. Okay, and then I you know I I fabricated it myself and it worked pretty damn well. But then I started to come come into this thing and I thought, well, you know, really, that's not really what I want there. I want something that's like stackable. Okay. Yeah. I want the foam to compress and so on and so forth, but I want it also to have its own divisions. Okay. You know what I mean? So I made it too. I took, I, I went and I found the, the thinnest foam I could find, which was two millimeters. And I, and I, and I, I made the washers out of two millimeters and so the next thing I would like to try is try to three. I want to go to a little bit longer screw and see see if it makes a di difference. And it may won't mean anything. Okay, you know what I mean. You know I've got whatever I can get out of it. You know. So. Most of the manufacturers, well, certainly the ones I've been buying anyway, manufacture those screws at ten millimeters on thirteen. Is that most? Does that cover most brands? Certainly the ones I buy. I buy scale. Well, I've got ten. I've got ten, and I've got twelve. So that's 12 is what I was going to try. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think... And then you lose a bit of it with your nylon nut. And there are nylon nuts, plain nuts, but with just made of nylon. And there are, those are available. I just purchased some for the first time. And they're available in two or, well, certainly different in different thicknesses, let me say that. I bought some from Scale Auto and I bought some from Mitus, and they're different thicknesses, different colours, easily identifiable from one another. But for the first time, I've now got nylon plain nuts. I don't actually know whether they bind on the thread like a nylock. The one, the one thing I like about the experiment is the whole onus of it is that it fits completely into a slot dotted car, and that was that was you know that was important to me. I don't give a shit about any other cars other than a, you know, a motor pod opening for a slot dot it. And, uh, and so whatever I do with this conglomeration of stuff, you know, it just screws into the car. You know? And uh, so I, I think it's pretty cool. So you'll be buying coil springs next to see what they do as well. I have an idea I want to throw out at you. Um, and it's one that we've seen in other slot car chassis for, the pod nuts to to allow them to be adjusted from the outside without having to take the body off, and that's basically having having it be a plastic, you know, an injection molded plastic nut, so it would work fine with your SLS printed nuts as long as the hole is the you know appropriate diameter for whatever screw you're going to use. Put a fin on the nut, and then a channel for that fin to go up and down in, but won't allow that nut to rotate beyond the tolerance of the fin in the channel and you've got that big old box behind the motor that'll be perfect to put a channel down for those nuts to follow so you could have the nut you could have the channel be as as tall as the motor for that for that suspension nut and then all you've got is a screw going up through the chassis and the pod through your your silicone washers or whatever and then through that nylon uh, sls nylon nut with a fin on it yeah, let me let me highlight that. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that that wouldn't add so much weight. If either. you was that scale look auto, at, or? yeah, scale auto, yeah, like that. scale auto nine sixty three. Yeah, you so can see got... that's got a a uh, a slot for that uh, piece to fit on, and the upper piece is the nut with a spring. Yeah, and that's yeah. I've seen that. I, I mean, you could even say that NSR kind of does that with with their. Um, 
pod yeah. screw and nut system, but it's much yeah. shorter. It's not really for big, tall suspension like that, but you can get obviously things to do that. So I think that would work great for what you're doing. Yeah, low cost so at uh, what um, Blake Carro does, because I believe that that is the best system in order to be able to set not totally to be able to kind of screw or tighten up how much um, travel you want with the, the suspension bit on top, but also limiting the, the travel. And it does in a very compact way and very functional. So that's something that need kind of uh, should look at if you have to sign something from scratch. I need to go on, I mean, to move on, have another another meeting at 12. So I'm going to see, maybe I'm going to join later on. I don't know. So I go to the gym, but good to see you all and uh, take care. Yeah, you know these guys will be hanging around for two more hours after six. So. <laughs> <laughs> see, see you, you too. See you, guys. Okay. <laughs> John, you had your hand up for the longest time. Do you still have something you want to toss, toss in there? Yeah, I'll just go ahead and run it. Um, yeah. This... As, as Garth has his uh, enthusiasm of ideas going, suspension system, it's me, God, everything. Mine seems to go along the lines of uh, resin bodies. And <clears throat> I found this online, and, and uh, it's, I think it's made, it's not, that's not working. Uh, let me see if I can. <laughs> yeah, find it. This is a Firebird, first first generation uh, Pontiac Firebird, which was essentially a Camaro, uh, first generation Camaro. And you, you see how it comes with the when you buy them from at least off eBay. The uh, wheel wells are filled and uh, no glass. You have to cut these these window uh, windscreens and that sort of thing out and, and find replacements for them. But I think uh, because it is a fire and this is a it's an electric Camaro, I think they'll fit. Firebird may well fit uh, electric or Pioneer Camaro chassis pretty pretty well. And maybe the glass and some of the other parts, the roll cage, whatever. Uh, but uh, that was that was the idea. And the, the uh, probably two years ago picked up a uh, was the first one of the first resin bikes I thought was a Genco Stinger Corvair. It's a, it's actually a Corvair, you know. I'm converting it to the Yuko Stinger. And this thing took tons of work to clean out all the excess uh, slosh resin uh, underneath the mold. Uh, yeah, John, I just want to say that not all resin casters do that with their resin bodies. Just saying. Just saying. I understand. I understand. Uh, <laughs> and I appreciate that. I really do. I hope, hope to appreciate it more uh, from somebody from Canada. But, uh, this one is much lighter, much, much more precisely. The Firebird is much more precisely cast and uh, much cleaner. So they're obviously made from a 3D uh, form. Somebody's doing the 3D form, then they they create a mold from that. And but but the 3D, you can feel the the uh, what's it called the the grain of the print. Layer lines. Grain lines. Layer it, lines. Layer lines. Yeah. You can feel the layer lines. It's not nearly as prominent as it was with the Yenko Stinger that I bought two years ago, for instance. And the body was cheap. So uh, sometimes th good things happen. That's it. Thank you. You got plenty of projects to keep you busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Wayne, you got some show and tell, or you want to do Club Corner? No, I've got some show and tell. All right. Um, I'm going to try and share a screen from the phone again. Okay, just so you know, you've got two video streams that are going to be sucking up your bit, your 
your bandwidth. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to stop the video stream from the laptop. From, I've done that. Okay. You might want to stop it from the from the phone too, but Okay, so we see your your bag full of screws. Yes, I found on AliExpress, I found guide screws. Ah. Nice. It'll so I've got I guess plenty of those now. What's the shaft length? Like four mil? Four or five. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's four or five. It wouldn't be any longer. It doesn't really matter enough. if it is longer, but a lot because a lot of guides have got space for a That'd lot more. It's enough though. Yeah, it's enough. M2, wide diameter heads. Uh, there they are lying around on the towel. And there's one installed in a electric car. This is the car that I showed last week. I also topped up on Body screws. these. Um, these are actually called 256 the thread. They're, they're bigger than two millimeters. They grip body posts quite well. My favorite titanium body shell screws, new pack. I bought that little jobby there that goes on the end of my power supply. <clears throat> That's so that I can plug it in, plug this power supply with variable voltage. Yours didn't into come my... with my sorry? Your power supply didn't come with a whole big old thing full of adapters? No, it came as as seen. Yeah. So anybody shopping for those power supplies, shop it shop a little bit harder because you can find people selling them with nothing, like apparently Wayne found, or you can find them selling with just a rack full of adapters. Oh, that's handy because that was a pound. It cost me a whole pound. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the hard part of shopping for one of those adapters is finding the UK plug. Oh yeah. So that does limit my choices most of the time, but that allows me to plug that into my arc air power track which means that i won't necessarily have to run at 15 volts anymore yeah but you which, can't go down very low because it's the computer will will brown out that's a fear that i've yet to face how low have you gone i haven't i haven't used okay. it yet. <laughs> i'll be surprised if you can go lower than 11 volts before it browns out um, uh, hello can you go <laughs> Not very low. There's there's a fella in Queensland running uh, banker loads on a six line track with those power supply. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's running uh, FK130 like cheetah top motors on it. Yeah, those are perfect motors for individual lane powers. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I purchased a scale auto standard suspension kit which has got ten millimeter screws in brass. Opened the thing and discovered five springs in there. <laughs> you got a spare? No. The, the, the ones in the top right are the soft. The coppery colored ones in the bottom were gold in the first packet that I bought, but in this one they're coppery and they're supposed to, so I, pres I presume they're the hard, well, I know they're the hards, but the really useful one, the black one in the top left, is the one that I have missing. Oh, That's unfortunate. Okay. So I've, re I've, con I've reached out to the retailer and they're going to send me another pack or at least some springs anyway. He said, I'll send you some more replacement springs. But that was a bit unfortunate. Yeah. And now we're on into, I'm going to stop the share because we're on into um, Club I mean, Corner. As far as I know, nobody else has any, any show. In Does anybody else have any show until they want to do before we segue to Club Corner? All right. Continue on, Wayne. Oh, gosh. I so you, know about, you guys know I went to a race at the weekend. And um, it was a Disca GT4 race. I showed the car in the chat last week. And uh, I went to the club on the Friday night, which where the track was open for practice and proving before the race on the Saturday. And while I was there, not only did we use Chrono, because we're used to using that, but we also used PC lap counter for the first time. We experienced what that does. It does some funky things and interesting things. Like when, I, when, when a race ends, a car crosses the line and goes into some kind of crawl, limp, limping mode, but the, the cars that haven't finished their race continue at full speed, which was snazzy. 
the race uh, the racing display is a little bit light, or configurable i should say so we made it quite large so that we could look across the track at the at the monitor and um, see better than you can with chrono what your what your lap times were etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we went into the race on so i had a pretty good car on friday night i, I believed and then we went into the race on saturday and we had a very good car. It's very, very difficult when you're running very, very close to stock cars to do anything at all that gets you the unfair advantage, or not the unfair advantage, but the best car on the track. It seems to be, you know, this, the regulations for this is so limited that it, it's, it's difficult to find the edge. But blueprinting the thing and making sure that you've got enough room for body float, etc., seems to be the key. Uh, making sure everything's working as it should and you've lapped in all the gears and all those kinds of things, and then you perhaps get lucky with a good motor. Where is the ability to share the screen? Start again. Gallery. So if anyone's not seen it before, that's what um, PC lap counter looks like during an oxygen digital race. I don't really know. This is probably qualifying. This is, yeah, this is the, um, I don't really know what that is because I can't see the bottom of the screen. I'm just going to scroll around a bit and find some relevant photographs. There's one. That's the layout of the circuit from the driver's stand, which is a fantastic elevated position for, for the track. Did the, the screen on the far side. From, did the layout change from last time? Marginally, yes. Can you see right at the front, at the bottom, in front of us? Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a section of the track where you're going left, 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 and climbing. Yeah. Well, the last time I used this circuit, this front section was dead straight, and what that meant that there is that there were fewer track joints uh, in that because that's the main part of the climb yep. and as we went over the crests of all of those track joints the, the angle of the surface would slightly change and it caused cars to high center and the last one just before the left corner the next left to the straight that leads away from us was actually causing cars to de-slot in that left corner and it was a, a challenging spot to drive consistently unless you were extremely careful that's just after that lane changer but what they did this time was they put more corners into that climb and that little right in the middle up there was a new track but a different track piece which meant that the layout changed slightly everywhere else i think it was the same i think a couple of lane changes may be moved i think the what there's one over on the top right corner there near the laptop that you can see over there i think that was a new one it went from in to out which was a little bit I think a little bit less useful than the opposite way might have been, but it did get used. Um, the ones in the bottom right here, they're typical. There's one out to in and then in to out. Not that anyone would ever do that in the, in, and pass a car in that one corner, but uh, they were useful. Um, mm. There were lots to choose from. And my favourite way around this lap is to change lanes twice per lap, and that is to go around the right, inside of all the right-handers and the inside of all the left-handers too, <laughs> which is two lane changes per lap. And you don't always hit them. You can, you know, you can switch your light on on your on your digital chip, and sometimes the track piece just won't just won't see it, or you've switched it on a moment too late, or something like that. So there's a lot of button pressing as well as trigger activity. I don't know why I took quite so many pictures of the screen. Is that the track in Derby? Derby? No, it's not. This there track is. is at North Wales Slot Car Club. This is in a place called Denby. Yeah, Denby. At Denby and Derby. Well, we do do digital slot racing in Derby as well. But Derby is the middle of the country, pretty much central into the country. It's on the, the north-south main motorway, the M1. And um, we're over in the northwest, not far from Liverpool, actually just in North Wales. Should have known from the Wales uh, 
flag. The Welsh flag on the wall? Yeah. Yeah, over there on the right, yeah. So I think what we're looking at there is um, lap time, a lap time. A lap, yeah, I managed an 8.75. I think this is still Friday night because on Friday night, I stored my controller settings by taking a snap photograph of the plan view because that was a borrowed SCP-3. I don't own one yet. And on Sunday, my teammate was, Saturday, I should say, race day, my teammate was going to turn up with his one. Go back. They're upside uh, down. I apologize. No, that's fine. Linear or curve? Curve. Yeah, that's about what I would do. There was no need for any. There was no need for any power trim on the on the tiny little twenty k motors. These are these are basically stock electric cars, right? Yeah, yeah. Twenty k sealed can S can motors. They call they call the um, Pendle Slot Racing AC six, but it's it's identical to a, a scale electric motor as far in every way that I can see. You didn't like more brakes though. That is uh, on a zero brakes is. That's on linear only. No, is it? Did you change your linear? Did you change your braking to linear only? Yeah, so that knob oh, is not okay. so in the way you would that's expect. That's pretty high. Okay. So that's about seven, six or seven, maybe, because yeah, you could adjust the way that knob works. For mo anyone that doesn't know, normally, uh, six o'clock position where it says zero, that would be zero brakes. And if you turn it to the right, like it is shown there, you would go into linear braking. And if you turned it to the opposite direction, you would go into what's called sweep braking. If you go all the way around to the infinite symbol, that puts 100% brakes on and just holds it on. And anywhere between there and zero brakes uh, applies the brakes and then releases them at different speed rates. It, it changes the speed at which the brakes are released. So it's like a braking followed by a coast. The downside of the way that slot it implement this is that they always apply 100% brakes and then bleed that away to nothing. And if your car isn't in a high grip condition, you can actually lock up a rear axle when the sweep begins. You can cause the car to be quite jerky and throw the, foot, throw the weight forward quickly when the brakes are first applied. On sweet brake, sorry, on, on fixed brake, if you set it at 40%, then it comes on at 40%. So the initial initial shock to the car when you apply the brakes is, is less. And it makes the drive a little bit smoother. And to my experience, more controllable. I like fixed brake on an SCP. Yeah, mm. so that's, about, that's about what I would have run. Yep. Yeah, nothing unusual, just... Nope. Common sense it's position. Of, it's, kind of, it, it's interesting to see other people, people who are experienced with the SCP and racing to see what their SCP settings are. And it's interesting that yours are so similar to mine. There is a right way and a wrong way. And, and unfortunately, there's just lots of, lots of ways to get it wrong, aren't there? Yes. And you've got so many adjustments, it's just easy to put it wrong. And you have to know what you're doing. You have to understand it. To get it right, the one the one figure eight configuration I've never really spent time playing with is the linear with step mode. Yeah, you can only you can you can't you can't use that with curve. Of course not. So curve uses that small knob, by the way. Yeah, every time blue switch, one. Yeah, every time I switch to linear, I don't I don't like it. So I pretty okay. much never do. Linear. And if you're really interested, the switch on the top was fast. Yep. Yeah. You got slow, medium, fast. But then again, that's all based on the weediness of the motors that we're using in these circumstances. We're working them really hard. We want yeah. everything. And it's Ninco track. And what, were the tires stock too, or was it? Uh... No, the, the tires were a handout BRM F22 tire. Okay. Yep. 20 by 10, I'm going to gamble. 20 diameter, yeah. 10 wide. F22 compound on Ninco track. Yeah. It's adequate for this kind of car at this kind of speed. Having said that, they were quite lively. And it turned out that the voltage on the track was 13.5. Holy shit. Oh. oh. So we left it there. <laughs> That'll change the motor. That'll change it, yeah. Yeah, they were quite they were quite spritzy. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were accelerating all the way down the straight, which is absolutely just the way you want it. Yeah. 
Um, they, were use, they were useful. That straight was only what, 16 tops? Gosh. Four, four or five meters tops? Yes. Not even, yeah. It's a fantastic little track. We did yeah, yeah. put some World Endurance Championship cars of the Disca, uh, the, the, the kind that we do in Suzuka and uh, Le Mans 24. We did put some of those cars on this uh, after the event. And they get up, they they really lift their skirts and run. And the one of the organisers said, oh, my word, look at that. You couldn't run eight of those in here, could you? And um, we said, well, actually, the lap time it's producing is only like three, four tenths faster. But so if you just turn the voltage down, I'm sure you could run eight of those in here. It's just that they wouldn't be any faster than the Skeletric cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can run them, just turn them down. Well, any rule set you like, you know. So that was Friday. Saturday, I uh, shot and uploaded these clips to my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in seeing some moving footage, head on over to Car Fun Mostly on YouTube. Have a little look and subscribe while you're there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Plug finished. This was one of the 20-minute qualifiers. The race format was very interesting. It takes most of the day just to do a three-hour race. But it's um, you set each team got two drivers in, and you pick your starting driver, and they go out and they do five minutes where the track is just open. There's no the, the lap scoring is on, but you don't have to do an, any number of laps. You can go out and do three laps if you want. It's all about fastest lap. So that was the first five minute qualifying. That sorts the grid for a twenty minute race, and. All the drivers do this 20-minute race, and those laps are written down on a piece of paper. So lap totals, 122 for car for mostly. That's myself, sports car racing. Was that myself or was that my, that was my teammate? And sports car racing, 120. And this is, this is what's happened over 20 minutes. And then we went and did it all again, where the opposite driver does a five-minute run, sets the fastest lap, and then goes out and ignore those. Goes out and does... Um, 20 minutes and we both scored 122 laps now this is a, a sector during the three hour race you can't see that we had some problems with this monitor because it didn't seem to fit the 16.9 conf configuration all that well you can see the right side is a little bit missing and the bottom's a little bit missing as well so the race elapsed timer is on the black bar at the bottom and it's actually chopped off on this monitor but I believe that looks like 20 minutes. So that's me. That's the other driver doing 122 laps. So we'll just move on till we get to the middle of the race. Well, yeah. 275 laps in. So yeah, we're 45 minutes into the race. There it is at the bottom. Look, two hour 15 remaining, 45 minutes elapsed. And this is a photo taken as we are about to change drivers. We're doing it up 45 minutes in our case. There's no mandatory number of... Um, Driver changes required, but we just decided we would do 45 minute stints twice each. Um, you have to do the driver change with the car in the pit lane. It takes four seconds or so to hand the controller off to someone else and for them to drive out the pits and get round to the start finish line. So there's about a four or five second penalty to that particular lap, and that's that's manageable when you're when you're leading. So after 45 minutes, we'd had some problems. We're now on 255 laps in sixth position. And the race leaders are 275 laps, 20 laps ahead of us. Now, the problems that we had were that my um, scale electric wheels, plastic friction fit wheels on scale electric axles, which have had the knurls pretty much removed, were coming off the car. What, why Was that something you did? I took the wheels off the car to be able to true them. Simple as that. I wanted nice round wheels to be able to put my tyres on. Yep. So all the wheels have been off the axles. And if I hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have had this problem. But Did you glue them? I did glue them on. Yes, I used CA to glue them on. Now, they never. you, you say that they, they never really go back on straight and yeah. things like that. So you have to do, I, I was doing my best to get them to stay on. And they've stayed on. I've done a three-hour endurance race with the same format over in Derby with this car before. Having said that, 
I did do some changes in particular with the front axle this time. I took some guide shim out from in between the car, the chassis and the guide quite a bit. And I made my front tires a lot smaller just to bring the nose of the chassis down lower than it had been by about 0.75 millimeters. I think I managed. So the reason I got the guide shim in was to accommodate the larger diameter wheels in the first place. And I thought, no, I, I don't like that. I want the, I want the chassis to be at least level and possibly nose low. So I took the guide shim out and then I, I threw the tire, front tires down again and then recoated them with glue and reconfigured them to a different diameter because the axle height is fixed. So that was the thing I'd done between the last race and this race. And unfortunately, I didn't do it thoroughly enough because I got into a bit of a pickle. And that was the insofar as uh, the hubs on my Skeletric front wheels were splitting. And I got myself into a situation where I, I was trying to repair them with glue and it wasn't holding and it wasn't giving me any friction when I pushed the wheels back on the axle. And uh, I was in a bit of a mess. And in the run up to the race, I was sweating bullets because I didn't think I was going to be able to get the car back together. And then I came across some silicone O-rings and they're actually manufactured to remove skin tags from your body. You may basically ins install an O-ring over a skin tag and it cuts off the blood flow. And I discovered those in our cosmetics department. And I thought, I wonder if I can stretch those big enough to hold those wheels um, back together whilst the glue sets, et cetera, et cetera, and make them nice and round again. So I did that. And then when the glue had set up, I thought, you know what? I'm not even going to take them off. I'm going to leave them there because they're reinforcing the glue, the glue joint. And what happened to us was the front wheel, that we, we first of all noticed the front axle getting wider. We could see front wheels poking out from the, from the body shell as the car was doing laps. <laughs> and I brought the driver to the pits. I was marshalling, replaced myself as a marshal, brought the car to the pits and pushed it back together and realised there wasn't a lot of friction until the car, until the wheels were just about to bind as they met the chassis. So I sent the car and I went to the pits and I picked up my super glue and my pin and I had them near my Marshall point. And the car ran for five, six, seven, a number of minutes before the problem happened again. And this time a front wheel went to, uh, went away, uh, astray and it rolled across the track. But now we've got a car that can't do laps because it's got a front axle that's hanging out halfway across the car, halfway across the next lane. It was recovered by a, uh, a marshal, handed to me, and it was now in the pit lane. I found the wheel. <coughs> so now I've got a tube of glue, and, and I'm squeezing it onto a pin, and I'm poking that down inside the wheel, and I'm trying to reassemble the car in a way that I don't glue my wheels to the chassis, mm -hmm. and I don't put glue in the bushings and cause the front axle to bind and all of that. So I put the car back together really carefully, and I send it. And it doesn't work because six, seven, eight minutes later, the wheels come off again. So now I'm thinking, oh, my God, what can I do? How can I do this differently and still not get, uh, you know, I, I've lost a shim because I had a shim between the wheel and the chassis. I've lost that. And we're running without that already. How can I put this together again and it not bind and it not cause a problem? So I tried a different approach, and that was to put the glue on the axle and then put the axle in the hole. Needless to say, in that four, first 45 minutes, we had the car in the pits at least three times, I think. Once, yeah, at least three times, probably four. And this is where we were 45 minutes in, 20 laps down. Another video clip from a Marshall point. We now got 35 minutes remaining. And this is when, uh, so, uh, yes, okay, so the car ha held together. Well, oh, this had to have been two or, th two or three driver changes later. Yes, this is quite a lot later. I took over the driving at 45 minutes. That was me taking a picture and then turning around and then hand, taking the controller. And from 45 minutes to 90 minutes or half race distance, I drove and I had no problems whatsoever. The car held together. I did my bit and we cut the deficit between us and the leader down to just 10 laps. And unfortunately for the back half of the race, we never managed to shut that gap again. This this is 35 minutes remaining and we've got 11 laps of gap. And at the end of the race, we ended up with 10 laps of gap. So we, we came back from sixth. We got back to second, but it just took so long 
for us to get 10 laps out of the cars that are the guys that are driving the sports car racing car and they're good drivers one of them's Gary Skip who's very good and his teammates was particularly on point this weekend Martin he was he was very good I, in fact I, I commented to him I said I, I congratulated him because he held it together really well but in the last 20 minutes of the race they switched driver back to their strongest driver just to make sure that they weren't going to lose that race which is a great position to be in. They could just defend their lead. <laughs> if you off, yeah. we'll, we'll lose your laps pretty quick. Well, it, it, when when the cars, are, I mean, sometimes you have crashes that you're not responsible for in digital racing. You know, it, the, these things happen. But um, yeah, we had a great race, and this is how it ended. There were a few recorded lap times there that were below what we'd set as the minimum lap in the software. We don't quite fully understand how on earth it happens. It doesn't seem to be a PC lap counter problem because we get the same problem with oxygen. Uh, sorry, with chrono. It seems to be an oxygen problem and it's supposedly fixed. And for anyone who's interested, we ran oxygen 4.10a. If I'm not mistaken, there might be a 4.10b. Anyone? Is, would you know, Greg? Yeah, this was... That, um... I won't say for sure, but it, it feels like there was a version released right after your race. Oh, right. That soon. Gosh, it's changing quickly and it's changing all the time at the moment. But since Suzuka in January, uh, there were, I know there's been a version that, that, that claimed to have solved the short lap problem. But I know that Geo has experienced, uh, been able to replicate the short lap problem. Uh, and certainly we had it again here. But we've we've attempted to run, we, this club, of which I am kind of on the periphery as a member, it's my local sort of thing, um, have run three digital events on that track or a slight variation of that track now. And on the other two events, the lap counting was done with version three of different... Uh, iterations and the lap counting has been absolutely appalling to the point where we went home with a gentleman's agreement about on one occasion anyway uh, we went home with a gentleman's agreement about who we thought would won and who we thought was second and who we thought was third and things like that and the rest of it didn't matter because the lap counting was just appalling but this one was the first time we had something on the screen that we can reasonably be reasonably confident that it's that it's accurate we know that uh, we had a crash with two or three other cars along the main straight and went over the start finish line without our guide in the slot. And when the marshal solved that problem just after the start finish line, being an astute team member and fellow marshal, I was watching the lap times of the cars as those same group of cars came back to the line. And I noticed that our car had done a 24 second lap. And that's perfect for having had a crash. When you're doing nines, 24 is perfect for two clean laps plus a crash. So I know we missed a lap on that one occasion. And there were other teams that will have done the same. Doubtful that sports car racing was actually in that crash. So we think that that gap should actually probably be one lap smaller. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the result of the race. We were second. We know it. We know. We had a great race. All in all, the people there, and some of them had come all the way up from London. There was a team... Um, Underwood Welshman, you know John Underwood, he comes in the chat, he came from Oxford. I was going to say, was that, very our, was that our very own Mr Underwood? Yeah, that was Mr Underwood. And Welshman was Scott from the club. Um, a fantastic driver lineup, Both of them top quality. And obviously something about their car they didn't quite get right. I did see them mucking around with motors, rev testing some motors in the pre, you know, before practice, uh, during practice, sorry. Um, and G27 is Garage 27, right? It is. And that's um, Nick, who also has um, historically been in the chat. Uh, he came up from the Rockingham area. Gary, likewise, is not far from the Rockingham area, which is Corby. And both of these are four-hour drives away. But the most distance-covering team would be... North Wales? No, I think... It, I, th I don't know what they were called. Maybe, maybe they were called National Express. Ed... And Tony, who came up from the London area, Stamborough Club would be their local, and that's in North London. I don't exactly know where they live, 
but they were the people who were talking to us about our 20 mile per hour speed limit and we were we they were charging us about our national 20 mile per hour speed limit on our roads that's wales national and we were chiding them back about the fact that they live under the auspices of um mayor Ch Ch mr khan mayor khan in london and his um expansion of the um ultra low emission zone which he's done around London and the fact that they all have to sell their cars because they have to pay ten pounds a day to drive. it's twenty twelve pound fifty a day to drive a car that's non right, right, right. politics that. politics let's move so on. yeah we were we were having fun with that we were chiding one another about that. So yeah no that's that's how I solved my front wheels problem and this is a photo I took because those are those O rings. There's that nylon shim that white shim and unfortunately that's what let us down. We we also lost a rear wheel during the race, we had several wheel off issues. That's what cost us the race. And uh, all I really need to do is, well, I'll tell you what I think, post-race driving home, I'm thinking, where the hell's Garth and his wheels when you need them? <laughs> I need, well, I need, would they have been allowed? They wouldn't have been allowed, though. For a, for a friction fit, no, a plastic wheel would have been put. And, 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 and the, the truth, honest truth is that a grub screw aluminium wheel is allowed. Is it? It is. Wow. The reason I don't, I didn't do it, is because I wanted to. Well, not just because I'm a cheapskate. I wanted to do prove that it's possible to buy a stock scale electric car and not have to spend thirty quid yeah. on axles, gears, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I use the stock pinion. I use the stock sidewinder. The, the, honestly, the only thing that bothers me about scale electric and some of the other similar brands is that the front axle cannot pop out. I love Pioneer for doing for that reason. Pop yeah. out front axle for that reason, because because yeah, I mean you you didn't have to do it uh, on a you would not have had to remove that front wheel on a Pioneer to true it on uh, to true both wheels on in a whole yeah. or, you know that's the yeah that one small change would make such a big difference for the tunability of electric cars. Yeah, even if it just popped yeah, exactly yeah um it wouldn't i mean it wouldn't have to be adjustable height it wouldn't mean necessarily no, just be able to make the back. front tires round <laughs> yeah just enough that's it that would be great yeah unfortunately i mean i mean the, 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 do, i've never done it myself but you can do the uh oil the axle and then put super glue in where the axle goes through the plastic to basically make a super glue bushing exactly what i do move the slop yeah yeah, I do that. I do that in the bushing. I do that in the nylon bushings in the back because yeah. they're oversized just because the nail has to fit through. That's true, yeah. So I tighten up all the tolerances. Th those are the blueprinting things that I spoke about that are, that are part of the preparation. Now, the regulations actually permit for cars from Carrera, cars from SCX, and cars from Scale Electric. Yeah. The SCX is very difficult when you've specified which motor that we're going to use, and that is the SCAN because the SCX doesn't necessarily hold the hair scan very well. Not without an adapter, yeah. Um, the Carrera cars just don't tend to figure because they're heavy. Yeah. You know, so I unfortunately, it's, it, it becomes a one-brand class. Pioneer doesn't do GT. GT3? GT, yeah, GT cars. I would love Pioneer to do some GT3 cars. That'd be a, that'd be a great foil to Skelectric. <laughs> I don't really know how... I mean, what are the body shells like on... on are they heavy or light or what? What the... I, I I compare Pioneer to Skelectric very closely as far as overall quality. You know they have their own guide system, which a lot of people don't like. Just like people don't like the Skelectric guide system, but it's easier to replace than a Skelectric sport guide is. You know, is it? As far as you know, fitting things in and stuff like that, you still got to shim it and stuff. But just the just being able to pop the front axle out is such a big thing. Well, I've got one Pioneer, and I and, and I look at it and I go, which bit of this car is any good whatsoever? Because I've heard that these things are incredibly popular, but well, I, as, one, as one an engineer the, looking inside of it, I'm disgusted. One of it's the main a, differences is that the axles are not knurled. Yes, that's right. They're not. So you can so you don't have to do any axle modifications if you want. Well, to put the the bushings wheel. don't fit in the chassis. They're all over the place. Wibbly wobbly misaligned bushings. Yeah, it's Skelectric, you know. I'm comparing him to Skelectric. I mean, I, I'm looking at my first pioneer. I like the fact that he's got brass bushings everywhere. 
I like the fact that it's got bushings in the front. I've got no heart, but they're just the misalignment potentially, and the fact that they don't Which even pioneer see legend. You know, okay. yeah. yeah, you know the guide. Oh, model guide, terrible. <laughs> All right, let's let's get some other people uh, to do their thing. Thank you, oh, Wayne. Sure. That was great. That was a very informative report. Thank you. I don't remember who had their hand up first before, uh, after Wayne, but I'll go ahead and call on Lenny first, and then we'll get Jim. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, just a a uh, spreadsheet from a recent event we had. We had one of our thirty-six minute handicap races two weeks ago, and. Um, as for usual, I went back through the last three races we had. This time we raced the DTMs. So where are we? Yeah, so we went, went through and found the, the last three races and picked the best scores out of that. And um, worked, uh, worked out the lap differences be between the fastest and the slowest going down. And then multiplied it by three because we take them out of a 12-minute race. So this week, um, Jeff managed to get up and win handicap. Um his scores were unusually low for the previous couple of races. Um, Jeff's normally one of the front runners, but uh, must have had some trouble with his cars or something. Anyway, he um, got a, a bonus lap of 21 laps against uh, Ian and Andrew, who got, who got zero. And uh, he didn't have a great race, but uh, he still managed to hang on to the to the win. Um Norm was up there as well. He was only he, he was the third fastest in the group overall on on raw scores uh, on the best laps, but he had a pretty all, all ordinary night as well. So it was young uh, Andrew G. Um, he's got this rather recalcitrant Mercedes that wants to fall over every time it looks at the corner. But um, some of the boys have been working with him on that, and at least the car will go around corners now. So in the end, Jeff won it um, on handicap. From Steve, from me, and Bert, and then uh, the two scratch guys came in in fifth and sixth. Uh, overall, the winner was um, Andrew. No, sorry, Ian. No, uh, by less than a tenth of a, a lap. So that was pretty competitive. They got two ninety one against uh, Jeff's two eighty two, but we weren't able to un overcome his twenty one lap bonus handicap so that's all i've got um seems to work out pretty well with the with the handicap scores uh, the guys are happy with it but they all have fun there's no sheep stations on it so you know no one seems to worry too much if someone gets an unfair advantage but uh yeah so congratulations to jeff okay that's it for me stop the share so normally jeff is pretty high on the roster anyways is what you're saying yeah yeah yeah, he, he, he's, he's, you know, he's, some of the classes he's outstanding. His Group C car is outstanding. And nothing gets near that. But just going back to the weights and things, um, that thing weighs a ton. Jeff runs with a lot of brake, and he's able to do um, some fairly quick laps with that. But yeah. the rest of us run sort of fairly mild sort of weight ballast. So, yeah. But, um, Does he tend yeah, to so, yeah, so he was happy with that. Normally he doesn't like these sort of events. He just likes the, the, the normal three races a a night. But uh, he, he's happy to come along to this one. So, are you yeah. doing that? Are you doing that on four lanes with three minutes per lane or or three lanes? Yeah, four lanes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's three minutes per lane. Oh, but what we what we do is a thirty six minute race. So we we run through the the four the, the four lane rotation three times. To yeah, get thirty six minutes. See, people, a lot of people think digital racing is extremely complicated. But in reality, all we need to do is count laps. And that spreadsheet, no disrespect, and it works, I can tell, Lenny, but it looked great for, for an outsider, just looking at that, not knowing that, how it works. It looks like analog racing can be just as complicated. <laughs> just for oh, being... that's not that hard. I've no, no, locked this up in about 10 minutes. I was going like this the whole time. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was yeah. reading. All right. Words. I've... Do you want me to go back to it and try and explain no, it a no, bit it's better? Fine. No, 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 no. <laughs> We've lost it. <laughs> I wanted to, it I wanted works, to ask, it, though. It works if... in my head. All the other guys go similar to you. Oh, I don't know how it works, but it <laughs> yeah, works for me. Work. I'm curious if if you said Jeff likes a lot of ballast, at least in his Group C car, 
yeah. does he does he tend to stay in the slot in car on car interactions more than the other guys? I uh, put it this way: uh, his cars get incredibly wide in corners. <laughs> It's, the tail tends to come out a bit. Yeah. Not been on the receiving end of, of a few of his um, love taps. But I think, I think, yeah, I think... Well, he's probably watching to today. Hello, Jeff. Wait, can help. <laughs> hey? I, I say a few a, it was alluding to the car-on-car -car interactions that are sometimes unavoidable. I think a bit of weight actually does tend to help there, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. well, it keeps his car in, but it's so good for the lighter ones. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the guys in in draw was uh, loved to add lots of ballast to his cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was he was definitely he was a I don't know I wouldn't say sandbagger so much, but he he liked to use no brakes. He came from HO, so he liked to use no brakes, and so he he loved a heavy car, and he would just coast into the turns, and you know, you did not want to have an, um, a a crash with him. Because you're going to lose. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeff Jeff runs a lot of brake as well, so the car tends to kick the, the back end out going into yeah, the corner. Yeah, he's compensating like, for the way it works. He's a lovely bloke. Nothing, nothing against Jeff. Like I said, if you watch it, Jeff, I like. <laughs> uh, we love you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lenny. Moving on. Jim, what you got? Well, we had a race last week at High Sierra Speedway. And uh, it was a rainy day, but we had 15 people turn out, including a couple HO guys. So it was a great, uh, great event. Uh, what struck me more than anything on this weekend, other than the racing, was the diversity of the field. We had uh, Revo Slack Group 2, and we had all five cars in there. So we had Alphas, Dotsons, BMWs, Escorts, and Opals. And in um, uh, the Opals came out on top in this race. In GT2 Rebel slot, because we're gearing up towards our, our big race in June, uh, we had all seven cars. And this is the first time I've ever seen this in one of our local races. We had all seven marks of GT2 cars in the field. And see the lone Viper in the back. And uh, the predominant car right now is the Marcos. Uh, it was the winner. And so it seems to be really, really, really good, especially on these uh, short, small tracks. The GT3 field was same. We've. I don't think we've ever had. Is there uh, we've always had NSR, uh, scale auto, racer sideways, but we also had a black arrow. Jim, Jim, Jim. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you guys not include the F40? Is that in, is that out of the GT? Yeah, it was in there. Right there. Oh, okay. Straight on. Yep. Okay. Yep. There, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, but yeah, there was an F40. <laughs> so there were there was at least one of each. Um, in the GT3 race, which is multi-class or multi-manufacturer, we have the, the normal three, like I said, NSR, uh, Scale Auto, and Racer Sideways, but we also had a Black Arrow. First time we've seen one of those out. And those are the only four manufacturers that we actually allow in our class in Northern California. And we do require, similar to Electric Dreams, in that all these cars have to have the NSR 21.4 uh, long can angle winder in it. That's the only powertrain that you can run. So if you're not running an NSR, you have to change it. Um, because I've been doing some uh, testing with other things, the fast lap uh, of McLaren won, NSR McLaren won this race, the fast lap is 5.09. Uh, I didn't have time to test this car there because we had so many people, there just wasn't enough track time, but I ran it after the race and I finally put some paint on it. What is it? So, sorry, question? What was it? What car is it? It's a uh, Area 71 Ferrari 488. Oh, yeah. Pre-paint with paint, with paint, with not much sanding on it. So I, I need to sand it again and put another coat on it because you can see it's kind of rough, but at least it looks okay. At least it looks like a race car. No window. Uh, it's a test car. I, don't, I did not have time to put the windows in it, but they're like really thin Lexan, so there's virtually no weight there. Yeah. Uh, but I did. It's got all the major components in it, so I, I I was able to get a good test on how fast this car really is, and that's kind of the point. Like I said, the fast lap of the day in this class was 5.09 with the NSR McLaren. We usually run faster than that at this track. I'm not sure why. Um, usually the fast guys are running in the high four nines, but it, on this particular day, it wasn't. But when I took this car out after 50 laps, it was in the four eights. So Courtney, you might want to try one of these. It was really good. And I think it's down to the fact that this chassis is super stiff. 
Um, that's that's I had no ballast in it. Uh, it was not tuned. Uh, you know, it was built with good tires. You know, I did all the building in it, but I had no chance to tune it at all. I they just throw it on the track, and it was immediately down in the four eights on this track. So I was very impressed with this car uh, from a race car standpoint. But what does it weigh? I can't run it because it's not allowed in our class. What does it weigh if it has no ballast, Jim? I think it was around 80, 82. I, I forget, uh, quite honestly. But, it, it you know, it's not terribly heavy. The body is a little, little right around 20 grams. I think it was 19.5 without the glass, so probably 20 with the glass. Um, so it's right in there. In terms of dimensions, it's right in there with an NSR car. It has the same guide lead as my 4GT, the Racer Sideways, uh, yeah. within a millimeter. So dimensionality, it's right in the ballpark with all the other competitive cars. But this sucker was fast, especially through the the tight S's where it's a transition left, right, left. And it just stayed right in line. You could put power down through the little uh, kink in the uh, on the right side of the track where some of them just kind of slide. So like I said, it was just a first test, but it was extremely encouraging for a first test. And uh, after the test, Ian told me, you can't run that. So, because we don't allow 3D printed cars. But uh, as I said, it does fit the spirit of the regulations. It was built to the regulations that we run, but it's not allowed in our group. It was just a test. So, okay. So Jim, you were running that chassis in their pod as well, or did you run went, a different? No, they, they don't give you a pod. It's a racer. I used a racer sideways pod. Essentially what I did is I had a racer sideways Lamborghini that was set up for this class. I took all the parts out of it and put it on the area 71. Yeah. Interesting. So it was really good. Is the McLaren 720, a, uh, you, you commented that it won this race. Is it a popular yeah. choice? Is it a natural to be a really good contender? It's the most popular. I think my 4GT is better. It was not very good on that day when I ran it because my 4GT is running the 4.8s on that track too. But I had some issue with it that I couldn't figure out and it was just all over the place. Uh, so I still like for our class, you know, like I said, because it's not legal, I prefer the racer sideways cars. But the NSR is because you don't have to buy a different motor. You can, yeah. you, it's it's easier to build an NSR car uh, because of that. And what weight is your sideways at? 80, I think it's like 84. Okay, so you're, you're running that car about four, within four, well, you said it was 82, did you say? So it's very, I think, I think yeah, it, it's, well, and and my, my sideways 4GT has a couple grams of ballast in it where this car had yeah. no ballast. So they're virtually the same weight. Yeah. And they're yeah. kind of heavy because we run the long can motors. That's the only motor we allow. Yeah. So if you're running a short can motor, you could probably knock what six or eight grams or so or more off of it. Do you have a minimum weight regulation? No. Kim, do you run the uh, stock sideways chassis? No, I run the hard chassis. Okay. Because the sideways chassis are, are soft, aren't they? Not all of them, I think, are pretty soft. Yeah. I, I love them for plastic tracks. I do. No, I, I do run the hard chassis, and on, on the commercial, you know, it's got the four little bolts you can you can screw in to adjust the right. flex of the chassis. On the high bite tracks, I screw those in tight. On the low, on a regular track, I, I loosen them. What do you think about the uh, C8? Uh, I'm going to get one and try because right. they've they've theoretically designed this to be better than the McLaren. We'll have to see when, when I can get my hands on one. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit lighter. Uh, it, uh, you know, I'm taking this from the NSR website because they put the specs out. Dimension yeah. wise, it's about the same Three, as the McLaren two, within a millimeter one. or so. It is. But uh, it's it electric dreams. Oh, that, that's me. I'm sorry. Let me, let me. <laughs> New track record Orange Lane 706. No. Oh, that's not me. No, that's Courtney. I hit, I muted him. Yeah, Justin, Justin TQ. I saw that. Uh, Dennis was not. Dennis was in the twenties out of I think twenty third out of twenty seven. Talking about so Courtney's watching a race and you're talking about what? I'm talking about the race Courtney's watching. <laughs> I'm watching race. the USRA races too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, I forget what the last question was, but yeah, like the bottom line is that the Area seventy one cars look really good and and they run really good. It did when I was testing it. I let a friend of mine run it, and he has a true speed controller which he forgot has a coast setting on it. So he went into the first corner and it was like full punch into the wall and it broke it. Um, 
It only broke the front grill. So you, you know, would expect, and the reason I say this is I don't, it's, it's not a fault of the car. When a car goes full punch into a wall, something's going to break. So it's not breaking because it's 3D and fragile. The body was completely intact, but the front grill area did break. break um, fortunately, I have a second body, so I didn't yell at him too hard. But um, it's still in one piece. It still it's still in one piece. piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the front grill broke. And uh, so, or the front. Part of the body shell or part of the chassis, the grill. I, yeah, I have a, if I can find it real quick, I'll show it to you because I have a picture of it. Uh, but, on the NSR, yeah, the front grill is part of the chassis, isn't it? And the seven. Well, there, well, I say front grill. There is no grill to speak of. Um, you go. You look over. To be part of the body. Yeah, you should see it. Oh. Um, I'll have to find it. If I find it, I'll show it to you later. I don't want to hold you up. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it did break. It broke the front splitter off, and it's, it's you know there's a, just a very small uh, material there, so there there is a break point. Uh, and like I said, any other car would have broken something too. So it's not that it's 3D printed. It, yeah. I thought it was very fortunate that it didn't break the body taking oh, that big of a hit. So it's not the grill, but the splitter? It, yeah, it's just that front area, front lip, front splitter. Okay. I'll find a picture and I'll show you when, when I get a chance. Yeah, but yeah. Jim, Jim, didn't you buy two of those cars? Yeah, I do. They, well, they were a little they're, different style. There's a 488 and a 488 Evo, and the only difference is there's a couple extra scoops on the Evo, so I do have a second body that I can put on that car. But, you know, I, I probably won't because I got no place to race it because it's not legal for anything. You might. In, in, in our area. I might. I'm looking for an Area 71 sponsorship, the Jim Rose, <laughs> the Jim Rose Foundation. Uh, okay, let's set that one aside for after the live stream. <laughs> let's, let's let Mike Dag go. It. Greg, it's like you're babysitting us. I know, right? <laughs> it's like my job. Yeah, and I got to go. So, Courtney, I'll talk to you later, maybe. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Jim, go ahead, Mike. Uh, okay, I th I've got a couple of things to share. If I can find them. Supposed to be ready to go, man. Come on. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, this was well. Th this is a second race. First, we had DTMs, obviously, um, and the Opel Calibra is definitely the car to have. Yep. And it's about two and a half tenths faster than the other cars in the class. So what I do is I do a fuel burn rate difference on the Opal to allow the difference. And man, this went back and forth the entire race. Uh, and I lost it by the distance from the pit lane to the finish line, <laughs> which is We're just the ahead of where that, where the pit lane comes in. Were you the one running the Opal? I no, I was running the uh, uh, C class, the yellow one. So yeah, I I ran out of fuel just on the last lap, so I had to pull in and start the fuel thing, and it, that lost me the race. Yeah. But it went back and forth the entire time, um, and it was really really a lot of fun. And and Shiggy had gotten into trouble with, right off the bat, and was gradually picking us both of us up and it was a uh, man i had to do quality laps in order to keep up with that thing at all and i would you know lose the distance for the fuel and and my fuel rate was a little bit worse than shiggy's so he would he would pull up on me and it was it was hammer and tong at it man it was really good was um that, was that was that when he got the jump start or was that a different race no, uh, this race he got the jump start. The Group C race he got the jump start. How yeah. long are you racing for, Mike? When you're doing these fuel adjusted races? Pardon me. How long are you setting for a duration of a race when you're doing these fuel adjusted 125 races? 125 laps. So it's and about 20, 22, 23 minutes, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and this this I picked up my fastest Group C cars that we had, and. Uh, Essentially, well, actually, uh, Mike uh, Ratby uh, 
uh, qualified third, if I remember correctly, and finished second. Shiggy had jump start off the off the bat, which surprised the hell out of me because he was right on my tail right off the bat, and uh, uh, and the, uh, lost a, a lap and a half or so, and never got back as a result of it. Yeah, because he had to pull so, in. He had to do a stop and go. Yeah. So, but this is the way they finished here. Um, it was close uh, within a, a, a lap or two. Uh, there was no, no, I was surprised because the Jag is generally just a bit faster than a Nissan, but uh, I think the uh, home court advantage had some help there. Um, and Shiggy tends to be a little, uh, a little hard on the throttle periodically. And I think that's where he got into some trouble. Plus, we had a fair amount of ghost car problems uh, passing the ghost car and like, oh, man. <laughs> so uh, but it was fun. We had a, we had a good time. Uh, and that, that was it there. And then last night I raced uh, the stock cars with the flexi chassis. And I finally decided, OK, I really should work on mine a little bit. And I usually don't do too much because flattening those flexi chassis is a pain in the ass. You got to take them apart and tweak them here and tweak them there, put them back together in two pieces and tweak them that way. And I thought, you know what? Because I know that the front wings, there's a, there's a couple of wings that, that face upward uh, get bent fairly easily. And then it's, it's difficult to, to bend them back in the correct placement um so that you want them just above where the two chassis come together that they overlap and you want it to be just a, a slip fit across them it's really hard to get out. i said to hell with it i'm going to solder it so i soldered the front end and and then i took away a lot of the play at the rear there's a bar that comes through a couple of holes there so you have a little movement in the the center pan and the outside pans the, the outside pan is sort of a, a U shape roughly. And the center pan is a spine with two wings, kind of a T shape with the T to the front. Um, and I limited a lot of the, and then there's a bar through the holes that, that hold the back of, end of it on. And I limited the amount of play on that bar and it worked a treat. I qualified second in the, we there were uh, seven of us. I qualified second, and uh, I had a little bit of trouble in Orange Lane in the final. I qualified, and I won my heat. What we did is a Daytona style. That's what Shiggy calls it at any rate. Daytona style, style qualifying, where one, three, five, seven, and two, four, six, eight compete in a shortened heat for qualifying. And so we did that, and I won my qualifying heat. Uh, by about five laps, which I have never done before. I mean, never, ever. <laughs> so I was quite chuffed at that. And in the in the the heat race or the uh, A and B uh, mains, I was in the A main then from winning my my heat, and I ended up uh, finishing third by about two laps because I had a little trouble with one lane. One lane was extremely slippery and my car didn't like it much or my finger didn't like it much one of the two um and i had a couple i had three offs and the, the most of the other time in the other three lanes that i ran we ran four lanes out of the eight we didn't run a full full con uh full track because we had so few people and um I, uh, the other three lanes, I didn't have an off at all. And that's the difference between uh, third and first. <laughs> because I finished a lap and a half behind Shiggy and and Ratby. Um, so that was it. But I was pretty chuffed to be in the A main. And, and having a, a good car was really nice. It was especially good. in the We ran the, the three... Uh, outside lanes so we have a real tight corner on be on one section of it there and 
through the white and red lanes, my car was really, really good. I did, uh, well, norm normally on a, on a full, full setup, you'll run 40 to 46 laps or 44 to 46 laps. And I did consistent 44 laps on the, uh, on those, the three lanes. And then the fourth one, I only did 41 and that was the difference. So, but it was a good time. I had, I enjoyed it. And, uh, since we do a prorated as far as money goes, we pay 10 bucks to race. And then Walt, the guy who owns the track and, the, and rents the space there, pitches in a purse and I made 15 bucks. So can't beat that. And I didn't no. break anything. So I didn't have to spend any money. You came out on top. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Five bucks in the, in the green. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, good stuff. All right, uh, Jim, you got four minutes. I just got the picture of the of the of the breakage. So here's the Ferrari. Uh, you see the splitter on the front, and here's after the crash. That splitter is gone. So the body's intact, but it broke off that the you know the splitter, the bottom lip, right in there. Which, like I said, would probably happen to any car going to the wall full punch. And that, so it looked like the cha there was chassis right under that piece of body that broke. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Chassis was intact. No problem. I wonder what material, I wonder what the glues would work with that material, if any. I'd probably just put super glue on it to see what happens. Is it made of, is it claimed to be nylon? I have no idea. Most likely. Most of the SLS stuff is nylon of some sort. It's going to be difficult. Nylon, I think, is um, tricky to glue. Not like Teflon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else got anything for the last couple minutes? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and go over to the, the YouTubes and hit the stop button. And everybody, until next week, wave goodbye. Bye.